I'm rolling right now, yeah. It looks sharp there. Three, two, one. Welcome to Dropping In from Omega Institute, a podcast that explores the many ways to awaken the best in the human spirit. I'm Callie Alpert. Dropping in today, two storytellers with the moth, the nonprofit group based in New York City dedicated to the art and craft of storytelling. Kay Tellers is a senior director, a host of their live storytelling series and Webby award-winning podcast, a storyteller, and a co-author of the New York Times bestseller, How to Tell a Story, The Essential Guide to Memorable Storytelling from the Moth. Her writing has also appeared in McSweeney's and The New Yorker. Moth storyteller, Reverend Dr. Teresa Thames, is the Associate Dean of Religious Life and the Chapel at Princeton University and the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Soul Joy Coaching and Yoga. Born and raised in Biloxi, Mississippi, being a black queer woman from the Deep South informs her sense of the world. Most importantly, Teresa believes that freedom is not optional, rest is her strength, and radical joy is her resistance. Kate and Teresa, thank you so much for being here, for dropping in with us today. It's so nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So I'd like to start with you, Kate, and hear a little bit about your relationship with storytelling when you were a kid and just how you came to having such an appreciation for the craft of it. Well, my last name is Tellers, so it may have been inevitable, although when I was a kid, I hated that my last name was Tellers because I felt like I was supposed to be, you know, telling like Aesop's fables, which I was never really drawn to. But I come from, both of my parents are from very large families and, you know, stories are almost like a form of prayer for us. We repeat them. We repeat them to the degree that we did have an in-law that stopped coming to family events because it was like too many of the same stories. Um, but I really got into storytelling when uh, when I was in my 20s, my mother passed away. Mm-hmm. And uh, it really just forced me to think about, um, but you know, right after she passed away, we sat, she passed away at home and I was with our family in the living room and everyone was telling stories about her. And I remember in particular, my aunt told this story um, about, she said, your mother loved you too so much, which everyone says when your parent passes away. But then she told, she just created the scene and she said, I remember being at family events and all the adults would be talking and she would be on the floor with you two kids. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that's the image I need like to keep her with me. So um, I started to become sort of obsessed with legacy and you know, what we leave behind and aside from the things. And I was a performer at that time. I was doing comedy and stand up and other sorts of things and then doing day jobs to support that. And it wasn't as satisfying. And I heard a story from the moth on This American Life. This was pre-moth podcast, pre-moth radio hour. And I went to a live event and a few stories in, I just thought, well, this is, this is what I've always wanted. Like, this is the most honest theatrical event I've ever been to. Mm-hmm. I really feel like I'm getting to know every person in this room and we're sharing feelings at the same time. And I was hooked. Did you know at the time that your mom was passing and then afterwards when those stories were being shared with you that that would inform your future? Like was that, did you pick up on the idea that that might be paving a path for you at that time? Were you conscious of that? I mean, I knew the night that my mom died that my entire life would change. Mm. She was diagnosed when I was 14 and she passed away when I was 28. So I became an adult with the fear of the loss of my mother. Like Mm. it's like fused into who I am and then the subsequent loss. Um, But I didn't know how that would manifest. And I never dreamed that it would that it would lead me to a career that and a life and a worldview. Like I, I I had no idea that it would manifest in this way. And I think honestly, I was just like sitting at a temp job, listening to podcasts, like just trying to be inspired by something, mm-hmm. you know, and it was that. I just heard the story and I thought they do this in rooms, you know? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And I went to a room. <laughs> Teresa, growing up in Mississippi, I know you were surrounded by the idea of folklore and storytelling in your family, right? Is that how, was that your first influence? Yes. um, Part of the African-American tradition is oral history, telling stories. That's how we hold our history, hold memory. And also growing up in the black church, that's how I learned Bible stories. And when... um, Anything would happen, people would gather on my grandmother's front porch and tell stories. And so this life of stories and storytelling was, it, um, it's captivating and enlivened me. And all my life, I've just heard story after story. Do you, uh, were, did you have an awareness that you were a storyteller in the making at a young age or did it take? 
some time? You know, I, I would never consider myself as a storyteller, but every report card said, um, intelligent, but talks too much. <laughs> <laughs> and so who knew that I would grow up and be, this is what I get paid to talk, like my profession is talking. But the idea of storytelling, I didn't understand what that meant. It was just a lived experience. When did you first realize that you were a storyteller? When I became a pastor. Um, being a pastor of a large downtown congregation and realizing that people came in for community and they really wanted to hear the stories of the Bible, but the language was such a barrier, the, especially the King James version of the Bible. And then it was like, how do we tell the Bible stories as a conversation and in a way that people can relate to? And I began writing my sermons in the um, in the space of a story, more so than a lecture or a sermon. So as one of the senior directors at The Moth, Kate, what is it that makes a great storyteller? Uh, well, a great storyteller uh, ultimately succeeds by being themselves and sharing themselves on stage. And a great story from that storyteller is an experience that is true to their experience, um, true to their lived lives that has changed them and affected them in a way that they care about. So it has to be a story where the series of events are meaningful to the storyteller and they have to have, uh, have been affected in some way by them. And then they need to be able to share that in their own voice, not in the voice that they think we need or you know, in a voice that's, uh, what, it's not a rant, it's not a stand up. It is simply someone being themselves on stage. When someone's telling a story to your point about the idea of being themselves versus being performative, is, does craft and or vulnerability, does one supersede the other in terms of the successful outcome? Or do they equally coexist with each other? I mean, I think they have to co they have to coexist. I think if you're si if you're simply you're if you're vulnerable to the degree that you have no uh, perspective on the experience, um, if you're just sharing this was a tragic event and I and I'm just going to share all of my pain, mm -hmm. that's not a compelling story. That's something that you know it, that that doesn't connect you with your audience, except for that your audience may want to hold you. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, but if your story is neatly crafted, then you're veering away from truth and vulnerability is like the sort of the naked exposure of our truth, if that's a definition that I just made up. But I would say that I would stand by it. Um, so if, if it's simply crafting, we have many skilled storytellers in our community that can take any experience and make it into a story. There's a hollowness that comes from that if there's not a real truth at the heart of it. Do you remember the first time you told your, your story, one of your stories, and did you recognize in yourself a strong storyteller? I did, I was really nervous. And it comes from what you just said, Kate, um, a tragic experience and I had a little bit of distance from it that allowed me to tell it in a way that I was like, oh, this thing is a story that I could share. And it ended up being comical and funny, but also healing for me because I had a distance from from this tragedy, this very deep personal tragedy. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit more about yeah. that? Like, with, um, can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that catharsis process? Did it happen before, during, after? You know, it happened a little bit before. My sister died very unexpectedly from meningitis. And telling the story of growing up with her and her being a little bit older and all the fun we had, that the story wasn't so much about her death, but this life that we had together. And my sister died on my birthday. And her death on my birthday just gave me this drive of living so that I could have more stories to tell. And so it was centered around, oh my goodness, my sister has died. But in stepping back and thinking about the life we lived together, it just transformed the story from being this sad thing to um, comedy and adventure. <laughs> comedy and adventures. Does everybody have a story? And does everybody have a story that's worth telling? Mm. Oh, I mean, I fundamentally believe that everyone has a story and a story worth telling. Are they ready to tell the big stories from their lives? Are they a person that would be open to the process of discovering what those truths are and sharing them with a group? I mean, you may have a story and discovering your story might be where that stops. You know, we don't all need to, of course, I love when people share stories with the world, but storytelling and the process of understanding your story can be valuable simply personally, simply for the act of self-discovery. Meta question, while we're in the space of an interview, 
Are you also, as part of you, in storyteller or producer head even, editing or witnessing yourself answering my questions? Or is it easy to just be part of a conversation? I think in this context, it's pretty easy to be yeah. part of a conversation yeah. because it's something that I love to chat about. You know, mm-hmm. this it, it's not like you're not asking me science. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I mean, we'll get there and we'll see what we can do. I'm, I'm very game. I'm incredibly game. So. <laughs> I don't even know if I'd know how to ask a proper science question. So I have you're no safe. idea what you're that safe. question would be. Fully creative and maybe we'll get a little mechanical about stories. Um, Teresa, you hold a congregation every Sunday? Every Sunday. Does that bring out your storytelling abilities in a similar way or a different way than standing on a moth stage? It's similar. And the one thing about telling a story is being aware of the audience as well. And being a pastor sermon writing, you write a sermon and that sermon, you have to be aware of who's in the audience, how it will be received. And then you may write a sermon that's meant for five people. And then there's 500 people in the room or a few thousand people who are coming in virtually, and how do you show up in the space? Um, Throughout the pandemic, I was filming in a Gothic cathedral alone with a camera crew. Mm -hmm. And so how to relay this very intimately, talking into a camera with no one in the space. And so the idea of how do I get this across to this audience, whether they're in the room with me, whether it's five people or whether it's thousands of people that I don't see their faces in the the moment. And do you have an answer to your own question? Yes. I mean, it's it's the power of telling the story and being as present as possible to the moment. I'd like to hear from you, Kate, how much the zeitgeist of what's going on yeah. in society informs the way you, um, the, the choreography of your events, the choice of storytellers. So I've been at The Moth for over a decade. Uh, we're 25 years old. I think I'm at 14 years Um and when I started, we were very, we were explicitly internally like neutral. We don't want stories. It's, the stories should be something that everyone can take in. We, if we come to people with an agenda, they'll hear the agenda and they won't want to hear it. And we still, we don't come with an agenda. We want to elevate stories um, from people from all walks of life. That being said, we know the danger of neutrality at this point. We've all lived through that. And so we are very actively seeking out stories that challenge dominant narratives. We're seeking out stories that come from people who have lived experiences versus observed or been adjacent to experiences. Um, We are looking when we do hear about something happening, you know, in the uh, when you're like in the zeitgeist, and I'm like, where do we begin? (laughs) I don't even know what you know. I know it's so loaded. But we do look, you know, we look for stories. that are that speak to the themes and the issues of what people are experiencing and we w- still would never have a story on our stage that would say you know that's why you vote Kennedy in 2024 you know we would never ever do that but we do hope that we have the opportunity to introduce people to people that would otherwise be strangers and that can perhaps affect and open their worldview mm-hmm. when we were talking in preparation for our interview uh, Teresa you talked so beautifully and powerfully about the opportunity at a place like The Moth and the craft of storytelling for lots of different voices to be in the same room and how storytelling has the ability to break through those barriers of gender and race and politics and all the other innumerable things we could name. Can you speak a little bit more about that and how much that informs your participation with this organization? Absolutely. This is a divisive time that we're in. People have strong hell beliefs and ideas, and it's easy to engage in passive aggressive arguing, um, posting things, and to get people in a room to listen to a story, not to come and to argue their side, not to write a thesis statement, but to be in relationship around a story and hearing people come in to tell their stories and from a different perspective or a different angle, it allows there to be a place of commonality, um, of intersection, and it really disarms the fuse of coming into battle. The space that I'm in right now um, in higher ed and a lot of conversations around freedom of speech, people come in ready. They're ready to, to argue their side. 
And something happens when they hear someone tell a story, and it may be a, a word or an experience or a time of day that melts away some of the divisiveness and people can really hear one another. And that is the power of storytelling, that it, it invites you in to lean in, to listen. And we do a lot of talking, but not enough listening. Definitely, and amen to that. And I feel like what I'm also hearing you say is that there's a great opportunity for humanizing way bigger topics that are so difficult to touch in so many other realms and forms of media, right? Absolutely. Um, just the idea of people probably being able to recognize themselves in most stories they hear, some nugget inevitably is gonna to touch them. Is that your experience? In Absolutely. Also, relationships matter. Um, yeah. No matter what you, we believe, there's a place of human relationship and connection that's so important. And when someone tells a story about their grandparent, you start thinking about your own relationship with your own grandparent. And those relationships allow people to have conversations about the possibilities of relationships, friendships that you didn't even know could be possible. Mm -hmm. And I say that my work is not to have equal consensus across the board, but how do we build community through storytelling and relationships? It's possible. Um, it's not magical. It doesn't solve all the world's problems, right. but it gets people talking in a different tone, in a different tenor, and the ability to say, there's possibility there that I didn't even know could be possible. Do you feel, Kate, and does the moth feel a responsibility to lean further into mm -hmm. what's going on right now? I know you were saying earlier that the intention was always to be neutral mm -hmm. and that now the times scream for that to not be the case. But do you, does, it, does it add a pressure to your organizing and sort of the choreography of all these events and choices that you're all making? Yes, of course, sure. Um, I think we, with everything that's happening in the world, I think what we learn is that there's a lot of, you know, to speak to the divisiveness, is that people don't understand on a human level what's happening with people that are not, not living their same lived experience. So it has, and also, you know, we are, by nature, any of us at The Moth are big hearted, very curious people that want to discover the world, that want to hear the other stories, that want to sort of understand. So certainly it has driven us to discover, you know, voices that, that people aren't hearing, um, that are touch communities that we don't already have a presence in. Um, uh, certainly it's lit a fire under us. I mean, we're all storytelling evangelists and we do believe that it can change the world. What do you say to people, Teresa, I'll start with you. What do you say to people that might not have stitched their own story together or haven't opened their ears yet to hearing other people's stories because they just aren't interested, they don't have the bandwidth, they haven't been exposed yet? Is there something you would say to them to spark interest? Oh, tell your story. Just tell your story. That's. One of the reasons why I love The Moth so much is that you don't have to have a degree, you don't have to have a background, you don't have to be an actress or a professional. It invites you to tell a story in your vulnerability. And I think a lot of times people step back from telling stories because they don't think they, they, have, they think they have to have right and perfect. And it's just this gift of sharing yourself and the vulnerability of it. And once you hear someone else tell a story, it gives you a little bit of courage to, to tell your own. And so I would tell people, start talking and hear other people tell their stories. Um, the podcast, the Moth Podcast is so great. Even if you can't make it to a physical show, listening to the podcast, catching the radio hour. And stories don't have to be long, min lots of minutes. Even the tiny stories, it just takes your breath away. Kate, can you speak to the mechanics of the storytelling process and how you help, you help your tellers to craft their stories? Moth events are a solitary microphone where the storyteller stands and then we have a musician on stage that acts as the timekeeper since they don't use notes, you know, and it is very exciting to be on stage should the story run long, the musician can play them. Um, we find our storytellers in all sorts of different ways, which does inform the process. So sometimes people will come to us and say, you know, uh, I uh, wrote this story and I wonder if it would work on stage. And then you would, you know, you're starting with kind of knowing 
pieces of what will be there. Sometimes we'll hear a recording of someone at an open mic event and we'll say that story that they told didn't quite work, but I love their voice. And I bet if we ask them more questions, you know, there's all sorts of different ways. But once we start working with a storyteller, it is, you know, um, to, to going back to what Teresa was saying too, is like so much of it is about just asking people questions and being curious. I mean, it is a, a bold and important act to actively listen to someone. And so people, it becomes a volley, and, and I think people find their stories by actually hearing that what they have to say is interesting and, and important. Mm-hmm. Um, so we ask them questions and ask them questions until we feel like we have some sort of an idea of what the story is. So we'll talk to someone and say, okay, so we're going to tell the story about you finding a home during COVID and the process of doing it. Then we start to think, well, then then we sort of map it out. So we'll start, you know, where you live now. We'll end, we know we're going to end in the home that you found. Um, and then sometimes the storyteller will write it out like an essay and send it to me. Sometimes I'll write out just the beats of the story and we start to tinker and close in. And then, you know, we'll get on the phone again and talk through it and say, maybe we need a scene here. Maybe we need that, you know, until we feel like, I don't know, it's coherent, it's together. Sometimes we work with storytellers, you know, over a couple of sessions for a show that's happening in the next month. Sometimes we have people, we call them, we have stories cooking. So you have a conversation with someone, it's sort of abstract, and we say, just go back and think about it. And then months later, you know, you pick up the conversation, oh, I'm going to be in the city near you, should we? You know, these, there's no, everyone is always asking me to like boil down the process. Like, how many times do I need to think about my story? <laughs> it's ready, which it just isn't, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, you tell it because the director has determined that it is in a good place and because the show is happening. And then we do a live rehearsal where all of the storytellers meet each other. For a lot of storytellers, it's the first time that they've had an audience for their story beyond their director. And for a lot of storytellers, that means it's the first time they've ever had an audience ever, mm-hmm. even though it's just five, six people in a room. So brave. Mm-hmm. It's Yeah, and it is, as we'll always say, when we tell storytellers, you know, we play houses that are thousands of people. Um, or we, you know, go to theaters where there are thousands of people and people will be thrown off. And I'm always like, the more people in the room, the more people that will love you. Mm-hmm. Like, I always want the bigger house, but I think it frightens people. But I will say that the rehearsal is the harder. I mean, you can yeah. speak to that experience. Is the, is the scarier share than the show. In the show, you have just hundreds of people loving you up. So they share the story in rehearsal, and then one or two days later, they go on stage and share it on stage. Teresa, can you put your finger on what being in the room at a moth event feels like? It's contagious joy. It really is. I recently did a moth show in Anchorage, Alaska, and it was in February, so cold, dark, and we'd been through COVID, and we've taken for granted that we could gather. We've taken for granted that we can be with people. And so I say that to say the room was electric. It was a sold out crowd. People were ready. They were hungry to hear a story. They were ready for it. And as soon as the first storyteller started, people were in it, the laughs and the sighs and the, and people just love being together and hearing stories. So it's contagious joy. And it is so much love and so much energy. And you feel it in the room. And I've missed that. I've, I've, I've been talking in empty spaces. And so to be in front of a live audience again and to feel and see people light up in real time, not on a Zoom delay, <laughs> it's a gift. It really is a gift. Do you think to that point that people are looking for inspiration, education, community, all of the above? Like, do you have a sense of that now from your storyteller head? Um, like when you're in the room, do you sense what people need? Does it matter to you as one of the performers? It's, I, I don't take for granted, I don't like to waste people's time and we're always so busy. So what does it mean for someone to leave wherever they are, to buy a ticket, to show up and be in the room with other people? And then like the gift of being present in a room. And I, so I think people wanna be together. People want connection. And as a storyteller, I am there to connect, not just to tell my story, but the power of a story is that it's connecting and you can see it connecting with people. And then afterwards, people come up and they'll point out something or they'll tell you their story or they'll tell you the time they were in that place. And so I think people come out because they wanna be together. You could stay home and watch commercials and get stories all day long, but being to physically together, 
We appreciate that more now than I think we ever have before. Kate, I'd love to hear from you. What, what do you say to people that have a story that they want to share in whatever realm? Mm -hmm. They just want to get more in touch with their own voice. What are the first steps? Probably the first thing from knowing kind of what you want to talk about and getting into what I would call a compelling story is starting to think about like, what are the scenes that I need to anchor my audience in? And so when someone is looking for any story from our, their lives, one of the things we say to them very early on is, in the movie of your life, what are the scenes that you would have to include? And that just gets people to think specifically about where they want to land it. And then you start to think about, well, then how do I connect those? And how do those scenes, those moments, like who am I before and after them? What, what, it, what is the shape of the, you know, you start to get into the shaping of the story. Um, we wrote our book, our fourth book, How to Tell a Story, The Essential Guide to Memorable Storytelling from the Moth, I've said 700 times in the past <laughs> two months. Uh, we dedicate that book to the untold stories mm -hmm. in all of us. And we hope the book is a very practical look at like, let's say you think you have a story or maybe you think you don't. Here are prompts. Now that you have this, what's the next step? What's the next step? And, you know, you can sort of walk through and think. And creating a story is nonlinear. The book is organized in a pretty intuitive way, but for a lot of people, they might jump to chapter five and then jump back to chapter mm -hmm. two. You know, you just have to start with thinking about, um, if I have a story, if I have an experience that I know has changed me, mm -hmm. how do I anchor it and start to specify it for the amount of time that I have to share it? I loved what you said earlier, though, also about the idea of listening, like how you prompt and coax the stories out of your storytellers as you're working with them. Yeah. Can you speak to the importance of listening? Absolutely. I mean, we always say uh, stories beget stories. Mm -hmm. And at The Moth, if you come to one of our shows, you'll see that the storytellers sit in the audience. And I mean, we're very lo-fi in many ways, but that's not just because we don't want set pieces. It is because we want to communicate this idea that everyone in this room has a story. It just so happens that these five people are going to be the people that share them first. But the dream is that you'll hear those stories and not the dream. I mean, our, our dreams have come true. The, you know, people hear stories, but then they relate to that. And then they turn to the person next to them and they say, well, I saw myself in this or I didn't or I didn't realize that this was an experience that could happen. We stand by our mission, which is we celebrate the diversity and the commonality of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And that idea that someone can tell a story that's about a series of events that might open our eyes to a series of circumstances we've never heard before. But a great story also has like a common human thread. So we may not have ever had the experience, but we felt alone, we felt heartbreak, we've fallen in love, like these common feelings that exist as part of the human condition that will resonate with someone and prompt something mm -hmm. that then they can share. I'd like to ask both of you this question. I, I'm, I'm sure it's not the first time you've been, the, the Kate, that you've been asked this. Teresa, I'd like to start with you. Do you have an outstanding moth moment, a story you heard that sticks with you more than many or most others? Absolutely. Excluding your own. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's the story from a comedian. Um, it was about, I think it was entitled The Best of Times and the Worst of Times. And this comedian's daughter was dying and his comic career was rising. And he would tell stories. He, would, he was telling um, jokes on television, um, getting deals. And then his daughter, his young daughter had cancer. And so this place of making people laugh and also trying to keep together his family. And every time I hear that story, I'm just like, mm. because a lot of us know what it's like to have public lives and we're performing and then have private lives that are eating us alive. Um, oh, just now thinking about it. Yeah. I love that story. Um, Anthony Griffith. Oh, yeah. Love so it. Good. So good. Do you have a, I won't ask you what your favorite story is, because that's probably not a question I can yeah. ask you or that you can answer, <laughs> I can ask you. Do you have a standout recently that moved you? Part of my job is that I sort of just fall in love with people over and over again. <laughs> and, you know, like, and I have this enormous privilege where people come to me and then are just like, I'm going to dump my life out. We always say it's like dumping a purse out onto the bed and then picking up pieces that people just dump their lives out and you make sense of it. I'll tell you this, this is slightly abstract, but slightly specific and not recent. So Ed, <laughs> as you will, but in, my, in my early times of teaching workshops, and this is an experience that like 
just solidified it for me that has played out in different forms since then. Part of my job is that I go into different businesses and they use storytelling both as a communication tool, as a way to build internal culture, as a way to connect people that work together. And I and that can be hard for people because they are in a professional environment and they have this person from an arts nonprofit coming in and saying like, be vulnerable. Mm. And it, it, so it's daunting for me because there's what I always felt, something I needed to break through. So I had a small breakout group and everyone was sharing and there was a guy, arms crossed, who said, I, I don't have a story. And I remember saying to him, um, like, you know, I just felt like, like it was so it, like, I just have to crack this person. And I said something like, I know you've had changes in your life. And I said, can you tell me, I heard you're a parent. Is there anything that, you know, that's a transition from being not a parent to a parent. And he just, it was just the question. And he was like, oh. And he told this heartbreaking but gorgeous story about when their child was born. It was a difficult labor. And he mm -hmm. thought at one point he'd lost his wife. And it was so human and so vulnerable. And everyone in the room at that point had shared. And he sort of pushed us to a different space. And I just thought, like, this is, this is why we do this. This is not what the energy of this room felt like when I walked in and all of these people have just softened, mm. you know, together in this sharing. Um, and it made me, it, it's what excites me when I go into places, particularly in businesses that don't know us necessarily in the same way that other people do, that I get to be that sort of gateway into, mm -hmm. okay, this is a different way of speaking with the people that you're with every day. Just the opening up process, the word that's looping in my mind right now is intimacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea that you're flooded by that all the time. It sounds like you're creating all the time as a safe place for people to be intimate and vulnerable. I love to laugh and cry with strangers. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest thing. Yep. And I always, I mean, to the point where my co-authors tease me about saying this because I say it so much, but I will say that first night at the Moth, the theme beginnings, what really hooked me is I felt like everyone in the room was breathing the same breath. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, again, I'd been in theater for years and I knew how to get on a stage and make someone laugh, but that felt like an exchange. And this felt like just this connection where mm -hmm. every one of us was just completely present, sometimes laughing, sometimes crying, sometimes quiet, as these 10 strangers got on stage and told the truth about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that to me is so exciting that yeah. we can all, that we can feel that connection to so many people at once. Storytelling is gift and it's holy. Um, when people, when someone shares with me their story as a pastor, people tell me like the valleys of their lives and I'm with them on the peaks of life. And when people share their story, it is this intimate space and it's holy. It opens up people to this vulner vulnerability that um, like I wanna handle it delicately. And so I, I'm so appreciative when someone gifts me their story and what you just said, it's, it's delicious. <laughs> it's delicious. So question for each of you, Kate, first, do you believe that storytelling has the power to change the world? I absolutely believe that storytelling has the power to change the world. I don't know. I mean, people largely change the world, and I don't know a better way to truly and authentically change a person's perspective than to let them connect in a real way with someone else's perspective. And, you know, you said, you spoke so nicely, Teresa, about relationships, and I think it's partially relationships, and it's partially, it's a way that, <clears throat> that we learn that goes beyond, you know, memorization. It is a way that we learn as our whole selves about other people in the world. Mm -hmm. Heart space over head space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you believe it has the power to change the world? It is, and it will. When our children are small, we tell them stories. We help them to imagine a different world. And in our storytelling, that's what we're doing. We are helping people to craft a narrative for a world that is possible. And the more we tell stories, the more we combat the popular narrative that's out there, we are making way in the middle of no way. And it is what will save us. Making way in the middle of no way. Can I quote you? Absolutely. It was so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Wow. Um, I have three questions that I like to ask all of our dropping in guests. Okay. I'd like to grant you one wish for our listeners and viewers. Grace. Grace to, to try again, to show up, to... Um, to be present to their lives and to people around them. 
Kate, what's one thing you'd wish for yourself? For myself? Grace. <laughs> uh, no, I won't steal your answer, Teresa, because it's so good. Uh, <laughs> what do I wish for myself? Um, just presence. Mm. Simply to be present in all of the, the beauty and complexity of what is happening right now. And then finally, Teresa, what is one thing you'd like our viewers and our listeners to take away from this conversation today? Joy. The joy of life and storytelling and relationships. You two blow me away. I could <laughs> cry and laugh all at the same time here. This is the most goosebumps I've had in like one hour in a really long time. I'd ask both of you if our viewers and our listeners would like to find out more about you individually, more about the work of The Moth, where shall they find you? So the easiest way to find The Moth is themoth.org. You can listen to our podcasts on all podcasting platforms. Uh, and you can find me, I guess now I'm really doing Instagram, mm -hmm. at the Kate Tellers on Instagram, if you need me specifically. Teresa? Um, you can find me on Instagram, Teresa underscore S underscore Timms, and my website, teresatimms.com. Thank you both so much. What a gift to talk with you today. Thank you. So appreciate your time. Thank Yay. you. Yay. Thanks for dropping in with Omega Institute. If you like what you see, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. To listen to the audio version of Dropping In, find us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Dropping In is made possible in part by the support of Omega members. Omega members enjoy a host of beneficial experiences when they donate to help sustain Omega's programming. To learn more, visit eomega.org slash membership and check out our many online learning opportunities featuring your favorite teachers and thought leaders at eomega.org slash online learning. I'm Callie Alpert, producer and host of Dropping In. Our video editor is Granel Knox. The music and mix are by Scott Mueller. Thanks for dropping in.